welcome to St. Hilary. We're so glad you're here. Please stand for the first song and sing along. I'll praise in the valley, praise on the mountain. I'll praise when I'm sure, praise when I'm down. I'll praise when I'm numbered, praise when surrounded. Cause praise is the water. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with all of you. We gather this morning on this beautiful, sunny morning to praise the Lord and to bless His holy name for the salvation that He has brought us through Christ. We thank God for this day, and we join in loud praise and thanksgiving of His name. Thank you for being here. Thank you for being with us at this Mass. And lately, I'd like to start with this little statement, if you could all read it with me. This is the Holy Mass. Today, I will receive God's goodness through His Word. I will receive the body and blood of Jesus Christ. My mind is alert. My heart is receptive. I will be transformed in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, welcome again, and if you have a child younger than three and would like to check out our nursery today, we've got some loving people over there who are ready, willing, and able to welcome your child. You can just follow the signs out the side door here or through the back. And of course, we'll have Jesus Jam today. Welcome Jesus Jammers. As we gather, let's take a moment to place ourselves before God, humbly confessing our sins with full confidence in his mercy and forgiveness.
May Almighty God have mercy on us, forgive us our sins, and bring us to everlasting life. Amen. Let us pray. Almighty ever-living God, who govern all things, both in heaven and on earth, mercifully hear the pleading of your people and bestow your peace on our times. Through our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, God, forever and ever. Amen. Hey, kids. It's time for Jesus Jam where we'll learn about God's great love for us with high-energy games, songs, and more. Just follow the leader with the colorful flag, and we'll head next door to Tarantino Hall. Parents, we'll be back before Holy Communion. Let's go! A reading from the book of Samuel. Samuel was sleeping in the temple of the Lord, where the ark of God was. The Lord called to Samuel, who answered, Here I am. Samuel ran to Eli and said, Here I am. You called me. I did not call you, Eli said. Go back to sleep. So he went back to sleep. Again the Lord called Samuel, who rose and went to Eli. Here I am, he said. You called me. But Eli answered, I did not call you, my son. Go back to sleep. At that time, Samuel was not familiar with the Lord because the Lord had not revealed anything to him as yet. The Lord called Samuel again for the third time. Getting up and going to Eli, he said, Here I am. You called me. Then Eli understood that the Lord was calling the youth. So he said to Samuel, go to sleep, and if you are called, reply, speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. When Samuel went to sleep in his place, the Lord came and revealed his presence, calling out as before, Samuel, Samuel. Samuel answered, speak, for your servant is listening. Samuel grew up, and the Lord was with him. 
not permitting any word of his to be without effect. The word of the Lord. A reading from the first letter of St. Paul to the Corinthians. Brothers and sisters, the body is not for immortality, but for the Lord. And the Lord is for the body. God raised the Lord and will also raise us by his power. Do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ? But whoever is joined to the Lord becomes one spirit with him. Avoid immortality. Every other sin a person commits is outside the body. But the immoral person sins against his own body. Do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, whom you have from God and not that you are not your own. For you have been purchased at a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body. The word of the Lord. Your word. 
The Lord be with you. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to John. Glory to you, O Lord. John was standing with two of his disciples, and as he watched Jesus walk by, he said, Behold the Lamb of God. The two disciples heard what he said and followed Jesus. Jesus turned and saw them following him and said to them, What are you looking for? They said to him, Rabbi, which translated means teacher, where are you staying? He said to them, come and you will see. So they went and saw where Jesus was staying and they stayed with him that day. It was about four in the afternoon. Andrew, the brother of Simon Peter, was one of the two who heard John and followed Jesus. He first found his brother, his own brother, Simon, and told him, we have found the Messiah, which is translated Christ. Then he brought him to Jesus. Jesus looked at him and said, you are Simon, the son of John. You will be called Cephas, which is translated Peter. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. I believe God has given you one thing you can do for him. It's unique, it's special, you're perfectly suited for it. In fact, you were made for it. Simply put, God has a plan for your life. God has always had a plan for your life, even if it hasn't always been easy to see. Sometimes obstacles get in the way of that plan, of understanding God's plan. You know, like a death in the family, a health crisis, oh, an unexpected move, a financial setback, a broken relationship, whatever it is. But God has already taken those detours into account. He's already working around them. The enemy will tell you that those detours are impassable. There's no way through. You're facing an iron gate and it's locked and you can't get past it. You might as well give up. With that kind of opposition, it's easy to start thinking negatively about yourself and believing that your life ultimately is limited and relatively insignificant. You may even see yourself as just one anonymous face among a huge flock of, huma of humanity, of, of the human race. Seven billion people on the planet, what difference could you make? What impact could your life have? How could your life matter? Last week I told you that that's not the way God sees you. To God, you are a miracle. You matter. Your gifts are essential to his plan. You stand out from the crowd. You are a one of a kind. In God's eyes, every life is special. Every person is a work in progress waiting to be revealed as one of God's many masterpieces. Now you may have struggled understanding God's plan for your life, but that doesn't mean there isn't one. So today, I want to talk with you about how to understand God's master plan for your existence. And the answer is simple. It's a really big idea. To know, God, to know God's plan for your life, you have to know God. The better you know God, the better you know Him, the clearer His plan becomes for your life. But getting to know God is a lifetime, lifelong experience. It's an endeavor that takes your whole life. It's difficult sometimes and it can be confusing. So today I also want to offer just four ideas, four points, four thoughts for you to think about 
in how to get to know God better so you can get to know his plan for your life more fully. So here's the first point. To know God, to know God's plan for your life, you have to know God. And to know God, you have to know his voice. You have to learn to be able to distinguish his voice from all the other voices that are out there. Samuel was a young man in the Bible, and he didn't know God. From a very, for for many years, his mother Hannah had prayed for a child, and she had promised God that if he gave her a son, she would give him right back to serve him all the days of his life. And when Samuel was born, Hannah made good on that promise. She took Samuel to the temple, and from a very early age, Samuel grew up there under the guidance of an old priest named Eli. Late one night, as we heard in the first reading, Samuel was sleeping in the temple. He heard a voice calling his name. It was God's voice, but Samuel thought it was Eli's and ran to him. Eli said, go back to bed. It wasn't me. Over and over, Samuel kept mistaking God's voice for that of Eli, his mentor. It took God four times to finally get his attention. Samuel had difficulty recognizing God's voice because, as the passage says, he was not familiar with the Lord. It wasn't until Eli taught him about the ways of God and showed him how to speak to God that everything finally clicked for Samuel, and he began to uncover and and discover his plan, the plan that God had for him, and God's purpose for his life. After that, the Bible says that Samuel grew up, and the Lord was with him, not permitting any word of his to go without effect. To know God, you have to know his voice. You have to be able to recognize it and distinguish it from all the many voices out there in the world. And that takes practice. It doesn't come easy because God kind of whispers. He doesn't talk in loud voices. And so maybe one of your New Year's resolutions might be to spend a little more time practicing listening to God's voice. Maybe spend some more time in silence in this new year. A perfect place to do that would be in the prayer space that I hope you created in your home. We talked about it during Advent, about creating a little cozy place in your home where you can just spend a few minutes every day just trying to listen to God's voice. Second point, to know God, you have to actually look for him. Long ago in the time of Jesus, there were two men who were trying to know God. They were learning about him from John the Baptist. They were his followers and his disciples. We often think of John the Baptist as kind of being alone in the desert, just all by himself, this solitary figure, but he actually had a circle of followers, people who listened to his teachings about God. Well, one day John the Baptist is speaking to his disciples, and all of a sudden he stops in the middle of everything. And he points to Jesus who happens to be walking by. And he says something very strange. We hear it in the gospel reading today. He says, behold the Lamb of God. What does that mean? Well, John the Baptist was referring to an ancient text in the Old Testament of the Bible written several hundred years earlier by the prophet Isaiah. Isaiah had predicted that one day a suffering servant would come to save the people by dying for their sins. He said that this suffering servant would be like a lamb led to slaughter. In other words, the lamb of God. Well, when the two men heard this, they knew it was their signal to follow Jesus. So they started following him, literally. They started tailing him and Jesus turned around and asked them, what are you looking for? It's the most important question, isn't it, of our lives. It's the most basic question. What are you looking for? What are you really looking for in life? My friend Robert was a successful businessman. He worked for Microsoft in the early days as a coder and 
made a lot of money when the stock sold. He invested that money in another business. He built it into a, a successful enterprise and he sold it for even more money. By all accounts, this man who came from humble beginnings in the Midwest had achieved the American dream and more. But eventually, Robert came to a crossroads. He wanted to start looking for something more than money and success. A lot of people don't really know what they're looking for, so they end up chasing after the wrong things, many of the wrong things in life. Robert figured out that wealth, prestige, possessions, power, all these things, they really aren't the right thing to look for. They aren't the right things to seek in life. And so Robert now knows what he's after. He's looking for God. He's pursuing God like the two men in the gospel reading. To know God, you have to know what you're looking for. You have to look for God above and beyond every other good thing in this world. Third point, to know God, you have to decide where your heart really belongs, where your heart really is. The two men who are following after Jesus asked him where he's staying. Kind of a strange question when you think about it. Like you just meet somebody, he's like, hey, where are you staying? Normally you ask, where did you go to school? Where did you grow up? You know, but where are you staying for the night? Well, disciples would often travel with their rabbis. And so on one level, they were simply wanting to know, well, if we're going to follow you as your disciples, where are you staying tonight? Jesus responds with an invitation. He says, come and you will see. But the invitation goes much deeper than just overnight accommodations. The word used in the text, the Greek word used in the text for stay actually has a deeper meaning. It means remain, remain. Come and you will see and remain with me. It's really a matter of the heart. Remaining somewhere is a matter of the heart. You can stay in a lot of different places, but where you remain is a matter of your heart. Jesus spoke a lot to his disciples about remaining with him always. He wants us and our hearts to choose to remain with him and make him the first priority in our lives. When you remain with someone, that's your first priority. A friend's college-age daughter over the Christmas break told her that she is sick and tired of watching her mom being stressed out all the time. She's doing too much, her calendar is too full. She works a full-time job, she's trying to work out and get in shape, she has an active social life. And lately, she's taken up knitting as a hobby. And she's stressed out over the fact that she can't seem to keep up with her self-imposed quotas for producing knitted products. So she's all stressed out and finally, enough was enough and her daughter intervened. She said, Mom, you got to put the most important things first. Knitting can wait until you're, you're retired. <laughs> put the most important things first and stay with those things. Stick with those things. Out of the mouths of babes, right? Our priorities are set by our hearts. This young girl gave her mom good advice. And it's good advice for all of us. It's our heart that determines our priorities. And so to know God, you have to make him your first priority and where your heart truly wants to remain. It's a matter of making Jesus matter in your life. In fact, that's our mission at St. Hilary Church. We put it that way. Our mission statement is to make Jesus matter to everyone. And so to know God, you have to, you have to look for him. You have to be able to recognize his voice and know his voice, but you also have to make a commitment to remaining with him in a heart-to-heart -heart relationship. Fourth and last point, to know God, you, you need help. You need a guide. You can't do it alone. 
Faith is a team sport. You need people to guide you along the way in your faith. Andrew, who was one of the men in the two men in the gospel reading, one of the first things he did after he followed Jesus was go and get his brother, Simon, and bring him to Jesus. And when Jesus saw him, he called him Peter. He renamed him Peter. And in that moment, he revealed to Peter what his new life would be all about, what God's plan and purpose for his life was all about. He said, you are Cephas, which means rock, and you are the rock on which I will build my church. And Peter's life changed forever, all because Andrew, his brother, went and got him and said, we have found the Messiah. Andrew knew what he was looking for. He had heard Jesus' voice. He was absolutely convinced, and he was going to remain with Jesus and stay with him in a heart-to-heart relationship, but that wasn't enough. He had to bring his brother Simon along. Had Andrew not done that, Peter would have never known the Lord. He would never have been our first pope. He would never have been the leader of all the other disciples and written the letters in the New Testament. He wouldn't have been one of the foundations of our faith had Andrew not brought Peter to Jesus. Everyone needs a guide. For that matter, had John the Baptist not pointed out Jesus as the one to follow, none of this would have happened. You see, we all need a guide. We all need someone to lead us closer to Jesus. And you don't have to be a theologian to lead someone to Christ. You don't have to be a priest or a nun. You don't have to be an expert in the Bible. Andrew didn't know Jesus hardly at all. He had just spent one afternoon with him. And he brought Peter to him and, and the rest is history. John the Baptist, you may be surprised to learn this. John the Baptist didn't know who Jesus was either. Yes, they were cousins, but they didn't grow up together. And a lot of credible scholars now believe that John the Baptist actually grew up in a community out in the desert, a community of ascetical people, you know, who fasted and, 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 and prayed all day. And that's where he grew up. So he would not have known Jesus. The only way he knew that he was the Lamb of God was by faith. Being a guide for someone else is a privilege and the only requirement is that you have some faith. Last week, I spoke with you about our hope for Lent. We're launching a spiritual campaign to help everyone in our church learn more about God and His plan for their life and to grow deeper in in their faith. We're going to be using a book called Rebuilt Faith, written by Father Michael White and his associate Tom Corcoran. It's a wonderful book. And the homilies in Lent are going to be supplemented by this book and by small group discussions. And we'll give you the book for free when you join one of our small groups. This could be the perfect golden opportunity for you to sample a small group for a short and limited period of time. Just seven weekly sessions beginning February 11th. You know, sometimes... God communicates His plan and purpose for our lives through other people. Small groups are the perfect place to learn more about God's plan and purpose for your life and just generally grow deeper in faith. And you might be the perfect guide for someone in your group to lead them closer to Christ. You never know. Two weeks from now, We'll have Sign Up Sunday on January 28th. You'll have opportunities to sign up before that. Take a look at our website and the flock note coming out this week. But two weeks from now, we'll tell you all about the groups, who's going to be leading them, when and where they'll be meeting. They'll be on Zoom for you people who are joining us online, our online congregation. We love you so much. We're creating opportunities for you to join our small groups. And there will be opportunities in person meeting in homes or cafes, in parks, or sometimes on our campus. We'll tell you all about it next week, and we'll give you an easy, two weeks from now, and we'll give you an easy way to sign up, more details to follow. So, 
How does God see you? What is, your, what is His plan for your life? What is His purpose for your life? All questions we want the answer to. We should want the answer to. And Jesus gives us the answer in the gospel today. Come and you will see. Stand and profess our faith. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day, he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From there, he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and life everlasting. Amen. In this new year, let us offer our prayers to the one eternal God. For Pope Francis, Archbishop Cordelione, bishops and priests, and all leaders of the church, that like Eli, they will faithfully instruct God's flock in his ways. We pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. For world leaders and people of influence, that like Samuel, they will open their hearts to do God's will. We pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. For people of faith, that as temples of the Holy Spirit, they will glorify God in all their thoughts and actions. We pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. For people in every land, that they will seek the Lord and remain with him always. We pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. For the sick, the lonely, the poor and homeless, and all who suffer that they will find the Messiah and his comfort and peace. We pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. For all who have died, that they will stay with Christ forever in eternity. We pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. For Rowena Peacock, for whom this Mass is being celebrated, we pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. Good Shepherd, we thank you for calling forth our gifts and guiding us through this life. Please hear and answer these prayers in your most holy name, who live and reign forever and ever. Amen.
pray, brothers and sisters, that my sacrifice and yours may be acceptable to God, the Almighty Father. Grant us, O Lord, we pray, that we may participate worthily in these mysteries. For whenever the memorial of this sacrifice is celebrated, the work of our redemption is accomplished through Christ our Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is truly right and just, our duty and our salvation, always and everywhere to give you thanks. Lord, Holy Father, Almighty and Eternal God, for you laid the foundations of the world and have arranged the changing of times and seasons. You formed man in your own image and set humanity over the whole world in all its wonder to rule in your name over all you have made and forever praise you in your mighty works through Christ our Lord. And so with all the angels, we praise you as in joyful celebration we acclaim. You are indeed holy, O Lord, the fount of all holiness. Make holy, therefore, these gifts, we pray, by sending down your Spirit upon them like the dewfall, so that they may become for us the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. At the time he was betrayed and entered willingly into his passion, he took bread and, giving thanks, broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take this, all of you, and eat of it, for this is my body, which will be given up for you. In a similar way, when supper was ended, he took the chalice and once more giving thanks, he gave it to his disciples saying, take this all of you and drink from it, for this is the chalice of my blood, the blood of the new and eternal covenant, which will be poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in memory of me. The Mystery of Faith. Therefore, as we celebrate the memorial of his death and resurrection, we offer you, Lord, the bread of life and the chalice of salvation, giving thanks that you have held us worthy to be in your presence and minister to you. Humbly we pray that partaking of the body and blood of Christ, we may be gathered into one by the Holy Spirit. Remember, Lord, your church spread throughout the world and bring her to the fullness of charity together with Francis, our Pope, and Salvatore, our Bishop, and all the clergy. Remember also our brothers and sisters who have fallen asleep in the hope of the resurrection and all who have died in your mercy. Welcome them into the light of your face. Have mercy on us all, we pray, that with the Blessed Virgin Mary, Mother of God, with Blessed Joseph, her spouse, with the blessed apostles and all the saints who have pleased you throughout the ages, we may merit to be co-heirs to eternal life and may praise and glorify you through your Son, Jesus Christ. Through him and with him and in him, O God Almighty Father, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all glory and honor is yours forever and ever.
trusting in God our Father, we pray in the words that Jesus taught us. Deliver us, Lord, we pray, from every evil. Graciously grant peace in our days, that by the help of your mercy, we may be always free from sin and safe from all distress. As we await the blessed hope and the coming of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Lord Jesus Christ, who said to your apostles, peace I leave you, my peace I give you, look not on our sins, but on the faith of your church, and graciously grant her peace and unity in accordance with your will, who live and reign forever and ever. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you always. Let's offer each other the sign of peace. Behold the Lamb of God. Behold Him who takes away the sins of the world. Blessed are those called to the supper of the Lamb. Lord, I am not worthy that you should enter under my roof, but only say the word and my soul shall be healed. we 
The storm has been told by you. We're our children on a journey. Jesus, only you can lead us through. So let us. Let us pray. Pour on us, O Lord, the spirit of your love, and in your kindness make those you have nourished by this one heavenly bread, one in mind and heart, through Christ our Lord. Amen. Thank you for being with us today. What a beautiful mass, beautiful worship, beautiful music, and other things. You're beautiful, so thank you for being here. Um, 
We do have uh, donuts and coffee after Mass, so head on out over there if once the closing song is over. And also, uh, if you're new, if this is your first time here, or you need something from us, like a Mass intention or something, uh, Rena will be, <laughs> will be at the front desk, the welcome desk, to welcome you. So we can do all kinds of things for you now. So uh, we'll, we'll have that available. And we just want to welcome you if you're new. Thanks again for being here. The Lord be with you. May Almighty God bless you, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Mass is ended. Go in peace. Thanks be to God. Thank you so much for joining us. Have a blessed day.